I'm Hannes Westerman, Research Assistant at the Cyber Justice Laboratory of the University of Montreal. Thank you for joining today's workshop, Legal Text Analysis Using AI, Chapter 3. This event is part of a lecture series um, hosted by the Cyber Justice Laboratory, the Chair Lexon of Legal Informatics, and the ACT Project. It is the third event of the series. We previously had Professor Jackie Chung and Professor Rand Goebel. These events were not recorded. And today we have the pleasure of having Professor Wolfgang Alchner. Next week we'll have Professor uh, Dr. Carl Branting. So for, for today's workshop, we welcome Professor Wolfgang Alchner from the University of Ottawa. The way it will work at, is that Wolfgang will do a brief introduction and then we'll have a discussion session. Um, so during this, I will ask Wolfgang a number of questions, but it's really the idea is that you will have the opportunity to do that as well. So I really encourage people to use the Q&A option at any point during the session, and uh, we'll get to those questions as soon as they're asked. And you also have the possibility of folding up and down the questions so that we can get to uh, the most interesting ones first. So Wolfgang, over to you. Well, uh, thank you very much, Hannes, and also thank you very much for this invitation to speak at today's event. Uh, my name is Wolfgang Alsham, I'm an associate professor at the University of Ottawa here at the uh, Common Law section. I'm also the creator and director of the Legal Tech Lab that we have just founded here at the university. And today, uh, as Hannes said, we'll be talking about legal text mining using artificial intelligence. And there are just a couple of things that I uh, would like to flag before we go into the discussion. There are really two things that come to mind when I first read this title. The first is that, am I really using AI in order to do legal text mining? Yes and no. There's a lot of hype around AI. And so it's, it's often very difficult to distinguish what is uh, a person doing when he uses AI in order to do legal text mining. So what I like to, uh, the way I would like to frame what I'm doing is I do legal data analysis or data science for lawyers, which includes some of the AI tools. But as I'll hope to present in a, just a couple of minutes, uh, there are also other things that don't really fall into the bucket of AI, but that are really crucial in order to do legal text mining. Now, the second observation I had when I read the title is that uh, AI often is associated with very sophisticated machine learning techniques. But uh, the other point that I want to get across today is that often we can use very simple rules-based approaches in order to get us quite far in, in order to mine legal information and legal texts. So let me just set out a couple of things that uh, I believe are useful in this, in this arena. As I said, I believe we can use data science, data analysis in order to mine legal texts. Now, what do I mean by that? And why is that perhaps different than using AI only to use legal text? So there are three buckets of techniques that are really useful to lawyers in order to make sense of large amounts of legal corpora. That includes natural language processing, similarity science, and third network analysis. So what are these? Natural language processing is a branch of computer science and computational linguistics in order to treat text as data. Now, Natural language processing involves a lot of different techniques and we, we won't be able to cover all of them. But going back to the second point I was making at the outset that we can often use rules rather than sophisticated AI to get us quite far. I want to give you an example. So there are two types of tasks that you can imagine out there. One is akin to trying to define hate speech in a large corpora of social network uh, texts so for on Twitter. You want to be able to identify which ones of those tweets involves hate speech. So it's very, very difficult to write rules in order to define what is hate speech. There might be certain words that flag it, but there are so many ways of framing hate speech, it would be difficult to write rules to do this. So here we actually do need artificial intelligence. We often need human annotators that would identify this hate speech with a stop in order to train them an algorithm, algorithm that does this type of detection. But there's also a different type of task. Imagine for instance, you have 10,000 emails and you would like to identify all the telephone numbers in those emails. Now, of course, you can again train human annotators to mark the telephone numbers and then have an AI to uh, uh, mark telephone numbers in those that haven't been marked by human coders, but that's really an overkill because telephone numbers, they embody a certain pattern. And here we can use a much simpler 
um, technology in natural language processing known as regular expressions, which is basically a keyword type search, but instead of looking for words, looks for patterns. And here, a telephone number embodies a certain pattern because there, there are words, perhaps uh, a, a slash or another type of indicator between those words in order to extract those telephone numbers. So we have two sets of tasks. One quite sophisticated because hate speech is so diverse. The other one is quite amenable to pattern recognition to simple rules-based analysis. So where in between these two types of tasks are legal text mining tasks? Is it closer to identifying telephone numbers or is it closer to identifying hate speech? The argument that I would make today is that actually often it is a little bit closer to identifying telephone numbers. And so we can use a lot of rules-based mechanisms in order to do useful things with legal text. For instance, just with this technology that I was just talking about, regular expressions, where you are trying to identify patterns in text, you can do a lot of things with legal documents. You can segment text, so you have a, a, a lot of contracts, for instance, and you want to identify articles or sections within these contracts, often because these documents are very structured, they follow a certain pattern, Regular expressions are doing a very good job at segmenting documents such as uh, contracts, laws, or treaties. So that gets you quite far without doing any artificial intelligence in the sense of machine learning. Same thing when it comes to extracting key information from those documents. For instance, you're interested in identifying certain, certain rules in these contracts, or you are identifying certain references in court decisions, citations, References from one court decision to another follow again patterns. Similarly, rules, legal rules, good faith, clean hands doctrine, they often follow patterns. And so you can write rules in order to extract them. So in terms of information extraction and content analysis, you don't have to be very sophisticated in order to do useful things. So that's the first bucket of, um, of tools that we have. Natural language processing, which among other things includes relatively simple tools that lawyers can easily learn and apply. The second bucket relates to similarity. And especially in my past research, I found that similarity is incredibly useful. Think about all the legal research applications that involve similarity. You might be interested in finding a case that is similar to the case that you have uh, in hand. That's an application of similarity science. You might be interested, did that judge write this legal opinion or was it maybe his or her clerk that wrote that opinion. Well, you can use similarity science authorship detection also to answer that question. Or you're interested in how legal ideas diffuse in the system. You're interested whether the law adopted in one US state or one Canadian province might have been inspired by a law in another US state or problem, uh, Canadian province. By comparing the similarity of documents, you can trace these diffusion patterns. So something as simple as just comparing how different or how similar two, two documents are can get you quite far. And hopefully today we can talk a little bit about some of my research uh, that, that has applied these similarity techniques in the past. Let me then close with the third bucket that again can be very simple, but can be also very powerful. And that is network analysis. Network analysis again is all over the law when we think about it. There are references in court decisions that cite another court decision. There are references in statutory documents that cite other statutory documents or other regulations. And so the law, the system of law is really a network that we can measure and that we can describe using network science once we have identified and mapped those links. And again, we don't have to do very sophisticated things with that. Uh, just identifying where exactly in the network a judicial decision is, for instance, can already tell us whether it is an important decision, whether it's a landmark precedent, or whether it's actually not that important, not many other uh, courts or tribunals or decisions have cited it. So simple network measures, again, get us quite far in understanding the structures of a legal system and to do interesting research uh, with it. So that's a little bit of a snapshot of what I think lawyers should be doing when they are doing legal text mining using AI. And with that, I think we can, we can start into the Q&A. And uh, uh, as, as Hannes mentioned, uh, if there's anything unclear, please do, do flag this and I'll be happy to, to explain what I meant by that. 
Perfect. Thank you so much, Wolfgang. I think that was a, a fascinating introduction. Um, I have a couple of follow-up questions. As I mentioned also, this is really, the idea is for this to be an interactive session. So I see there's already some questions. The more questions you ask, the more interesting I think this will be for all of us. So, so please go ahead and use that, that Q&A function. So the first question I wanted to ask you is um, why? Um, you talked about analyzing uh, kind of legal documents using computational methods and empirical methods. And my, my question is, why should we do this? Well, I think the answer is very simple. It's the only way to make legal research scalable. Uh, think about it, how we solved legal problems in the past. You had to, to go to the library, you had to find a, a, a court decision, you had to read it, or in, in more recent times, go on Canly, do a search, find, and, and, and read the decision that you're interested in. Now, if you can mine all decisions, you will not only find what you're looking for, but you might think, uh, find things that you never thought would be out there that uh, are still very useful. And so the only way to really scale up legal analysis is by using data science. And that then, of course, opens a whole lot of different uh, promises and, and avenues, both for research and for practice. Just think about research first. So the only way to be able to, for instance, characterize a system of law properly is to look at all of the laws in that system. Or if you want to describe uh, the practice of a certain court, say you're writing a book on the Canadian Supreme Court on the International Court of Justice. Well, the only way to really make sense of all that jurisprudence that has been generated is by using legal text mining because it's impossible to read them uh, by, by hand. So in order to get that type of scale, we do need these types of tools. It doesn't mean that they are substituting traditional means of doing research. They often complement them by finding the information that we then want to analyze in depth and by generating just overview metrics that allow us to see trends, to see patterns, which we then investigate further. Now, the second point relates not to research, but to practice. And there again, there are so many opportunities associated with, with legal text mining. Once you have access to this large corpora of, of information, for instance, you can help help self litigants in order to better navigate this, this maze of the law because you don't have to go through a lawyer who's doing the research. Well, if you have a good system that provides this type of information and that makes it accessible to, to everyone, self litigants can, uh, can benefit from it. But in, in general, there are many access to justice applications that could be associated with, with this. And the fact is that Law is just getting bigger. There are more uh, statutes, more contracts, more decisions out there. And it's getting harder and harder for even experts to, to mine that type of legal, legal information. And so I don't see any way around using computational techniques going forward in order to make sense of this large amount of legal information and in order to scale the ability to do legal research. Very interesting. Thank you. So it sounds like using using these methodologies, you can kind of this this overview over all the data instead of focusing on, on single documents, I guess, to some extent. So my next question would be, what can we gather from those documents? Like what kind of analysis can we do today with computers and what is harder and how, how which effect might this have on, on the legal field in general? Uh, that, that, that's an excellent question. So I think going back to what I've said, so you can you can scale legal analysis, but that doesn't mean that you're substituting completely new tools uh, with the, uh, or you're substituting the old toolkit with new toolkit. You have more tools at your disposal. So often it's this bird's eye perspective that you've, you've outlined that is so helpful when you're doing legal text mining that you're able to identify uh, important decisions, that maybe landmark cases in a citation network. But sometimes you might not be interested in uh, the most important decision, you might be interested in, in outlines. You might be interested in explaining why certain decisions don't seem to follow precedent and then to investigate those in more detail, where then we would switch from this bird's eye, to, uh, bird's eye view toolkit to a more traditional legal analysis. Because the main limitation of legal text mining uh, in its current state is that it doesn't understand law really, right? So what these tools can do is they can mine legal text by doing something with legal text token. So they, they, uh, the algorithm recognizes words as being the same, but not necessarily the underlying meaning. While there are technical ways to get closer at the semantics, often the type of work that uh, is already very useful, 
is just looking at text tokens. And so uh, often what the what legal text mining then does is to provide us with sets of information that we then as subject matter experts need to evaluate. So it's, it's really just providing a different type of lens, perhaps a, either a telescope or a, a microscope, depending on, on how you want to, to frame it, to study what we've always studied, but both in more depth, because we can suddenly uh, investigate you know, these outlines. We can, we can see those individual cases that suddenly seem odd, but at the same time, we also have this, this meta view of, of the law uh, that allows us to discern trends that we wouldn't have been able to discern if we had just looked at a sample of decisions. Very interesting. So, so would you see this more as a as a complement and like as a tool for lawyers um, or more on the side of actually replacing some some aspects of how the law is practiced? Well, I, I do believe that there are tasks, tasks that can be replaced through this type of technology. So, for instance, uh, if you uh, if you think about junior lawyers in the past sitting in basements reviewing lots of contracts, for example, for pertinent information, their legal text mining can surely do a lot to replace at least some of the, the work that, that goes into um, uh, doing a triage, doing a classification between those documents are pertinent and those are not pertinent, for instance, for e-discovery purposes. So there are certainly tasks that I think can be replaced, but more generally, I do see it as a, as a complement that allows to do things uh, that we haven't been able to do in the past. And that's been particularly uh, particular interesting for, for research applications because we can suddenly ask questions such as uh, how do courts talk to each other at a, at a very you know, high volume uh, level that we wouldn't have been able to, to ask in the past just because it would have been extremely costly, even impossible to, to map all the, the ways that, that courts interact through, through the citations. Today, that's that's relatively easy. It can be done in seconds, and so there are just new things that we can do with this type of technology in order to better understand the legal system. Perfect. Thank you. Very interesting. So we have some questions from the audience here. One of whom, uh, which I'll read to you, and this is by Mina. She said, "Hi, you mentioned patterns." I find that the way Lord Denning writes differs vastly from that of other judges, as he is humorous while the others are not of the same style. Also, the writing difference between generations of judgments. So how does one find valid patterns based on the language of judgments? Uh, I really enjoy this, this reference to Lord Denning because Lord Denning, uh, uh, he was actually a mathematician by training before he became a lawyer, uh, but he was still convinced that law is an art associated with words and not with numbers. He, he was very adamant about this. So if he didn't quite know what promise data science could bring to the law, uh, then I think it points to a generational shift that, that we have observed that in order to make information accessible and to make arguments more convincing, it's not really only about rhetoric, it's, it's really about evidence-based decision-making. But that is just a little bit of a side note. Maybe we can revisit this in the course of the conversation. Now, more to the, to the question. Now, there is pattern and then there's noise. And sometimes you're interested in something that in some contexts is actually noise, but in other instances, it's, uh, it's a pattern. So let me give you an example. <clears throat> there has been some very early research on identifying authorship of the Federalists, uh, Federalist Papers, those for the for, uh, foundational documents uh, of the US uh, constitutional order. And it wasn't clear whether, uh, I think, well, who is it, Hamilton and uh, Jefferson, who wrote a couple of different uh, of those unauthored uh, Federalist Papers. And their researchers looked at what is known as stop words. So words that don't have carry any meaning that would be noise for any type of purpose in order to investigate authorship. So there, the noise was actually the pattern they were looking for because that pattern was then an expression of style. Now, in other circumstances, you are really not interested whether Lord Denning is more humorous than another judge or writes more eloquently. You're interested to trace the development of a legal principle. And there, that pattern is then, oh, the style would be noise. And so you would have to then fine tune your approach so that you can capture one or the other. 
whether that's easy depends really on the, on the tasks. Again, rule-based approaches can give you some way towards that, I, I would say. For instance, if you are interested in, in style, uh, there are ways to, to look for style using the grammatical structure of text, using certain signaling words. And if you're looking for specific legal principles, there are potentially also dictionary approaches where you would be looking for certain, certain signaling terms, uh, again, which can be implemented through regular expressions in, in documents. So it's, it's really about trying to identify what exactly you're trying to do, what could be stumbling blocks, what's noise, what's the pattern, and then trying to find a way through this maze. But it's a, it's a challenge always. Very interesting. And thank you, Mina, for this great question. We have also another question from the audience, from, from Jeremy. Mm, he writes, um, hi, Wolfgang. Thank you very much for the insightful introduction and great answers to the questions. I would like to ask you a rather non-technical question. How do you go about finding interesting legal questions that you can answer via legal text analytics? I'd really be interested in a detailed walkthrough beginning from the initial hunch, this could be interesting as well, and resulting in a set of hypotheses that you can evaluate. Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. And it's, it points to uh, one of the dangers as well in, in understanding law as data and in law as data science. Because often, if you think about law as data, you often start with data sets. You suddenly have this, this wonderful new data set and you want to do something with it. So the data comes before the research question. Of course, that's, that's not really ideal because then you're fishing for patterns, some of which might be more relevant uh, than others. And sometimes you're really just finding noise, uh, which you cannot interpret because you're not a subject matter expert in that particular domain. So the research that I enjoy most is where I'm a, a subject matter expert, where I come across a question that has occupied scholars for a long time, but that hasn't really been investigated through this data science lens. So to give you a very concrete example, uh, in, my, in my PhD, one of the things that I, I was interested in was how bilateral investment treaties had evolved over time. Because some, some people had said, look, this, this field is very homogenous. All states are basically doing the same thing. And others said, well, really, there's so much customization going on. Uh, if you negotiate with this uh, state, then you sign a different type of treaty than uh, is in, in comparison to uh, negotiating with, uh, with another state. And so we ran a similarity analysis across all these, these different treaties. And we found two things that are really interesting. One is that see, one single state often has one treaty template that it then uses across its negotiating partners. So whether, the, uh, um, whether Germany negotiated with, say, India or with, with uh, Cambodia, or with Poland, it didn't really matter. Germany had the same type of template. So there was no customization uh, as some of the authors had, had supposed. But the second interesting insight was that actually some of these documents looked very similar, uncannily so. So we knew that there had been some, some copying and some pasting going on, some diffusion. And as it turns out, uh, a lot of the countries, including uh, the Czech Republic and, and Hungary, and I think, well, uh, Slovakia, because it was part of Czechoslovakia, they actually teamed up at a certain point in order to develop a joint model, which they then use uh, uh, for their own purposes. And so we could trace that back to that, to that common route. And so we found all the types of really interesting patterns that of course are particularly fascinating once you have studied the field, but that, that only were, became possible because we were able to marry on the one hand, this deep subject matter expertise to know what to look for. But at the same time, we also knew what types of skills or what, what types of uh, analytical tools would get us there. And I think that's really the, the best type of science in that, in that arena where you marry subject matter expertise, proper legal questions with, uh, with, the, with the technology. But that of course is really challenging because you have to have a good understanding of both law and data science in order to match the tools to the question. Thank you. That was really interesting. It really sounds like <clears throat> the kind of analysis that would be uh, very hard or even impossible to perform, I guess, if you use, didn't use these kind of methods, just because you couldn't see as many of the, the kids at the same time. 
So would you say, performing this kind of analysis, are there any prerequisites on the, the legal area or, or the question that, um, that are required for this kind of analysis to work? Or could it, in theory, work on, on any legal area? Well, it, it goes back then to this, to this challenge. How do you connect a legal research question to the appropriate data science tool? And I think that's where hopefully in the future we'll do more work in order to, to match these two, in order to then provide textbook guidance to those who want to do this type of analysis. So I think one area where we are already quite advanced is, uh, is network analysis and to think about what type of network measures correspond to certain criteria of precedence. So we know, for instance, that uh, simple in degrees, so how many times a, a case has been cited, is actually not a very, well, it's a, it is one way of characterizing importance, but it's arguably not the best. There are other ways of uh, characterizing the place of a, of a decision in a citation network that are more appropriate. For instance, uh, hub and authority scores, or some have argued page rank. So there is a proper area of, of legal data science or of legal informatics, whatever you want to call it, that will increasingly look towards identifying the types of tools in order to match them to the, to the research questions. And that is, of course, then, I think, very task specific. But at the same time, because legal systems are, are quite similar across different different countries, I think there's a lot of common ground. So, so on, on network analysis, I know that scholars, both in Europe, in, in, in Asia, and in, in, uh, in, in America, are using the same types of tools to investigate constitutional courts in their respective countries using very similar types of, of tools. So I think there's a, there's a proper science that has to be done in order to catalog uh, the, these matching research questions and, and tools. But I don't see any area or any reason why there are certain areas of the law that are completely yeah, imperious or impossible to do uh, or to, to add value to using using data science. I think, again, you, you need to have a good understanding of the subject matter, and then you have to find the appropriate tool, and then you will always be able to add something. You might not be able to do too much. Maybe some things are just hard problems to solve, but maybe you can get a little bit further than what we've been able to do in the past. I see. So it sounds like this is really um, a, a cultural thing, I guess, as well as institution. So, so I want to ask, how do you create this kind of environment where people can can attack these questions and bring like people from that have these data analytics skills and people from the, the legal field together? And to what extent do you think both sides need to to learn from the other to be able to perform this research? Now that's a that's a fascinating question, and I I think there are two sets of opinions on this. So. Some people think that what you need uh, are teams where you have just a very good lawyer and a very good data scientist, and together they can do the magic. And yeah, I, I'm not completely convinced by that, just because there there's such a language barrier, there's just a such a such a barrier of understanding what exactly the research question is and what exactly the legal data science tool is that is appropriate. So often when I read scholarship that is based on, on author combinations uh, using one data scientist and, and one lawyer, there's often a disconnect. I find that there's either not enough discussion on the law side, or there's not enough discussion on the, on the data science side, or there's a bit of a disconnect where, where you think why, if that's really the, the legal problem they're trying to solve, why have they used this type of tool set? So I'm a big proponent of training lawyers in data science, which of course is then uh, a little bit of an uphill battle because many lawyers self-select into law because they don't want to do any data science because law, as Lord Denning has said, is, is the art of words, not of numbers. But I do believe that only if we have lawyers who are trained in data science do we see, can we really explore all the low-hanging fruits that, that, that are out there? Because even if then lawyers like myself, I'm, I'm, I'm of course not a, not a trained uh, data scientist, but I can do enough in order to do useful research. And I think uh, that is really the goal that I think we should be striving towards. Because I, if I team up then with a good data scientist, I can I have a much better grounding. I can understand what, what that person is doing. And then we, we can really do, do magic. Uh, but 
unless there is this common base of lawyers in data science or of data scientists in law, I really think that we are we are not um, yeah that's a it's not the same connection. So do you think that lawyers need to, to learn coding to fully appreciate this and be able to contribute? Or is it enough to get a, an understanding of the methods involved? Well, I, I do believe that it's definitely useful to get a get some experience and some, some exposure to coding for, for two reasons. One is to also appreciate the, uh, the limitations of what, what this means. There's, as, as I've said before, there's a lot of hype around AI, and so there are there are uh, many unfulfilled expectations, I think, uh, on the part of the legal community, at least with respect to those who may not be so familiar with, with what the technology can actually do. And uh, as we've discussed before, it's actually really hard to get a meaning. It's much easier to count words, which doesn't mean that it's not useful, but it's it's just useful if you apply to the right task. Uh, so learning how to code exposes you very vividly to the limitations because you suddenly know okay, that's actually really hard what I'm trying to do. But at the same time, it also creates some understanding of, about how programmers, how computer scientists, how data scientists think and solve problems. And that then opens your mind to its potential solutions because you, you start thinking a little bit like a, a, a data scientist. So that's why, for instance, I'm, I'm teaching a course, Data Science for Lawyers, and there we, we do learn how to code at least some basic data science applications. And I'm doing this specifically because I don't think it's useful if I throw a, a sophisticated technology at, at, at the students because there are so many ways of approaching to solve a problem that I don't think any type of software that is out there can, can do all the magic. But if you have a good understanding of the basic principles of what legal data science entails, what coding entails, you can evaluate different types of products and you can you can make more informed decisions of what what you really need in a particular circumstance so i'm yeah i'm a big fan of exposing lawyers and law students to program hmm. i see in the same way we have a question from from jeremy again and the question is um what do you think is more important in empirical legal studies subject matter expertise or technical proficiency because without saying that both are needed but let us suppose one is kind of spotty which one should it rather be or do you need to be true expert in both? Well, I think you have to adjust your expectations and your ambitions depending on where your strengths are. So I will confess my econometric skills are not the best. I, I can do regressions and I, I can read econometric studies, but I wouldn't feel comfortable doing an econometric analysis on an empirical uh, research question that has causal that, that tries to get at some causal force. So knowing that, uh, I will choose research questions that are perhaps more descriptive. But I don't think that's necessarily a, you know less less of a less worthy of a subject matter because actually a lot of what we are trying to do as lawyers is to try to synthesize information, try to synthesize uh, what courts are doing, what what contractors are doing, and so descriptive research in law can actually do a lot using the data science toolkit. Uh, on the other hand, if I am, um, and, and there are those legal scholars out there that are maybe either not as deeply interested in a subject matter or just, just haven't been so exposed to a specific, specific area, they might then see more fulfillment in applying rather sophisticated data science techniques or econometric techniques in order then to publish in, in uh, in a law and economics journal or an economics journal. So it really depends on where you situate yourself in that spectrum. But I think there's there's enough room out there and enough work that people can do interesting work in their respective fields. Uh, you just have to then be conscious of where you would want to publish. So I think, uh, yeah, as I said, econom economics journals or even law, uh, AI and law, which are more of a sort of more tech related uh, outlets are maybe less of an interesting venue for me than uh, journals that accept empirical research, but that are open to um, scholars applying these types of empirical techniques. Mm -hmm. So the good answer is both is good, both is possible. Mm -hmm. Cool. That means also like there's lots of opportunities to, to do interesting work in the field. Um, Jeremy is also very interested in this course. He asked, maybe if you can describe the contents of your course and your experience with teaching it. Um, are these law students or do you also include students of other schools? 
So I hope at some point to also have a pendant course in in the Faculty of Engineering where we would be teaching legal data science, maybe with a bit more emphasis on the legal questions uh, than on the coding side. But for now, I'm really just teaching this to law students. Uh, my um, uh, some of my uh, teaching materials are available online uh, using uh, the, the link data science for lawyer, uh, lawyers.org so you can check that out I have a couple of different lessons where anybody can learn how to code but the um, the way that I structure the course and other people made me do it a little bit differently is uh, based on three components the first one answers the question why should we even bother learning how to code or getting into this field and there are lots of interesting debates that we, we then get into uh, from this idea of scaling legal research to are lawyers going to be replaced by robots uh, or by, by technology? What are some of the impediments in the legal profession that might hinder technological innovation? The billable hour that might not drive lawyers towards efficiency and may then hinder the adoption of, of new technologies. So all this sets the stage and gets lawyers, I think, interested or law students interested in why they should be learning uh, technology skills and, and programming in particular. Then in the second part, I teach them programming, always with uh, applications in the legal domain, uh, things that we've discussed, regular expressions, relatively simple uh, similarity analysis. I also do a little bit of prediction because that's what some people find interesting. I, I'm not a big fan of this because it's, yeah, it's just a little bit devoid of really gaining knowledge about why lawyers behave the way they do. Uh, so I'm a little bit less interested this, in this, but uh, I, I do include it. And the final part of the course deals with what the impact of all this is on the legal system. So uh, suddenly, well, if, if we can predict decisions, what does that mean for, for judges? Are judges suddenly a little bit obsolete because we know what they are going to decide before they decide it? Uh, or how do we use this type of information? And uh, is there perhaps a, an asymmetry between those that have access to these technologies and those that don't? What's the ecosystem? Who are the winners? Who are the, the, the losers? So there are lots of interesting, more systemic questions that we, we often talk about. So again, in the spirit of trying to really bring data science and law together, I try to do justice to, to both of these fields in my course. That sounds super interesting uh, as a course. Um, do you think this kind of knowledge will in the future become more and more important or even required for lawyers to have? Well, I hopeful. Well, I, I would certainly hope that more more law schools offer this type of training. Of course, one of the challenge is that this is so new, right? And this is this is de developing so quickly. There is a bit of a hype out there that might, yeah, skew expectation and then leads to disappointment. You know, this idea of a, perhaps a second AI winter when people are disenchanted by what technology can do, and so there's there is a lot of uncertainty out there. So I, I don't blame law schools for not fully embracing this yet. But at the same time, of course, the, the students that we are training at this point, they will live in a very different legal environment. They might not even be lawyers. They might be uh, working in a legal tech startup, applying these types of uh, skills, or they might be working in a law firm, but uh, being at the intersection there with legal technology vendors to decide, okay, this product is something we should be buying. This is something we shouldn't be buying, maybe thinking about outsourcing. So there are just a lot of ways that the legal profession looks different in the future than it does today. And of course, uh, part of law school's mission is to prepare students for that. And that's why I think students are taking my course in order to be better uh, prepared and to be more at ease that this drastic change that's heading their way is more of an opportunity and not necessarily a threat. Great. We're, we're seeing a lot of great questions from the audience here as well. And so thank you so much for that. And I really keep it up. Like, I think this makes it much more fun and interactive. So we have another question here by, by Mina, who says, um, AI sounds expensive. Would it be accessible to sole practitioners? I ask because big law firms are expensive and regular people rely on sole practitioners. Well, that, that goes back to this, this last idea that I was trying to uh, to, to mention, and that's who are the winners and who are the losers. And right now, I think it's a, it's really an, an un, unanswered question yet. Uh, on the one hand, I see immense potential to, to democratize uh, access to justice and to democratize the use of tools. So if you, if you know a little bit of programming, actually applying data science, even as a sole practitioner, 
it, it's not that, that, that difficult. What's often difficult is to get access to the data that you would need in order to do the interesting stuff that you know is possible. And so uh, access to data is often where uh, existing players are using their dominance, uh, such as uh, publishers, who then don't share uh, that data. And in Canada, we are perhaps heading slowly to a direction where legal data, including court data, will become more, more available. So I think accessibility of data is a large determinant of, of how democratic this, this future will be. But assuming that access to data can be more widespread, I see immense potential, including for sole practitioners, not only for them using programming. I mean, they, they probably have enough to do uh, without programming in their free time. But then you can think about uh, building applications. You can think about crowdsourcing um, uh, applications. Universities have a huge role to play. I know Hannes has been doing very, very interesting work. Uh, the colleagues in, in Kingston have doing interesting work in the labor uh, and, and uh, well, Hannes in, in the uh, tenants, uh, tenant space. So there are lots of low hanging fruit that could be tackled once we have access to the data and once we can crowdsource uh, uh, so, some of the uh, some of the solutions. Now, at the same time, a lot depends also on the regulatory side. So, uh, once we take this a step further, can we create applications that are directly accessible then to to uh, customers that would replace legal advice? And here we are then in this uh, difficult terrain of who can provide legal services, what is an unauthorized practice of law. And how do we square the dual challenges of, on the one hand, providing access to justice, and on the other hand, and ensuring that legal services meet certain, certain regulatory uh, or, or quality standards? And those are the big questions, I think, that will determine whether it will make power asymmetry more, more unequal or will increase power asymmetry, or whether this is really going to revolutionize the field and uh, improve access to justice. Yeah. Super interesting, and um, it sounds like this this kind of revolution could come from from many spaces. So, I want to ask you: Do you think there will be um, units inside of the big law firms that do this kind of research and, and build these kind of tools, or do you see it more coming from the outside, from perhaps startups or academia even? Well, I think it's it's a very diverse ecosystem. Uh, there are some some applications that I think law firms have to do in-house. They don't, may, may not have to program things up from scratch, but there, there, there might be uh, just for, for confidentiality purposes or for, for protecting their in-house knowledge, things that they may not want to share. And so I, I can see in-house departments developing this type of, of expertise. At the same time, there will be lots of tasks that are more efficiently scaled uh, by a, a startup dedicating energy towards solving that particular problem and then selling that as, as a software, as a service. So I, I do see room for, for all of this. And, and then there are, of course, those types of applications that don't really have commercial value, but that have a big access to justice value. And that is where I think universities are particularly well-placed to, to fill the gap because our students, a lot of them have, uh, have the ambition and the, the urge to contribute to uh, closing this access to justice gap, and why not use that energy in order to uh, to build applications that otherwise would not be built? I see, so there it sounds like it's a lot about like data, and uh, data plays an important role here. And now we have a quite unique ecosystem in Canada with this because there is legislation and jurisprudence in English and French. So I want to ask. Uh, since you work in Canada, what difficulties and opportunities does this entail for the automatic analysis of this kind of data? Yeah, that's a that's a fascinating question, and I think uh, one that's it's really for Canada is, is so pertinent because, in order to be truly bilingual, ideally, not only will applications be available in both languages, but you also have to account for the idiosyncrasies of the two to types of, of legal languages. So uh, I've done research in the past where we've used the same corpora of text, both in French and English, in order to identify, if we just apply very agnostic text mining techniques uh, that many of you will be uh, familiar with, 
from term frequency analyses to, to, to similarity analysis, what are the, the results? Do we actually get the same type of results? And the answer is sometimes yes, but sometimes no. So for, uh, in, in some applications, if you are a Francophone researcher and you find you're interested in the most similar case to a particular case, you might be pointed to another one, to another case than an Anglophone researcher would be pointed to if the underlying um, analytics are based on the different language corpora. Of course, if you are training your architecture just on one corpora, say the English corpora, and then you make this uh, available and you just translate the results in French, you are actually um, yeah, undermining a little bit this uh, the bilingualism there because you are not taking account of these idiosyncrasies in the two in the in the different data sets. So that's I think a one one thing to, to think about. Now of course doing work on bilingual texts is incredibly difficult because obviously the models trained on one language cannot just be uh, deployed to the other one. So there's always a type of either translation exercise required or some kind of equivalence. So if you're looking for certain terms in one language you have to find the equivalent terms in the other language. So it's yeah, I, I don't think there are any easy answers to, to that. The, the one thing that I would say is that the more we think about law as data and the more we add levels of, of, of abstraction that's, that represents law not only through natural language, but also through, through code, there's this movement of law and law as code that's, that's uh, taking off, especially here in the regulatory sector in, in Canada, uh, where you're trying to represent regulations through basically code so that you can, uh, machines can interact with that uh, directly. So you can calculate, for instance, what, what the amount of fee uh, that you owe to the government. So as that becomes more and more important, we have to think about, is that solving the problem? Because then we have sort of this unified yeah, code as law that, uh, uh, or, or law, law as code that's not English, not French. So is that going to replace it? Is it going to be more authoritative or is it coexisting? Do we then even have more problems because we suddenly have three language versions, the code version, the, the Francophone, uh, the, the, the French version and the English version. So I think there are lots of, of interesting and, uh, and fascinating research projects, not only sort of empirically, but, but just the politics and the, uh, uh, the, the droit lang uh, linguistique are associated with, with tackling this, this problem. So it sounds like this development could have a, a very large impact on, on the field of draw, uh, law. And it, it seems like the, the regulator would have to have a big role here. And then one of the questions from the audience uh, from Jammer addresses this. He asks, what do you think about court decisions uh, banning application of certain types of analytics being applied to court decisions, making or uh, court decision making or decisions prohibiting deployment of automated contract builders without the endorsement backing of a professional attorney? Well, to be honest, I don't, I don't really have a, a strong views on, on this. I think th these are these are questions that that legal systems have to have to decide, and some may take uh, take one view, others may take another one. In, in France, for instance, uh, as you may know, there has been a recent law that bans judicial analytics, but that allows for other types of analytics. So you may disagree with that because. Well, you're really protecting the judge, and the judge is a public figure, and shouldn't public figures uh, be supposed to be transparent? So I think that there are arguments that you can make why certain type of legal text mining should be allowed, but there are also arguments why it shouldn't. And so I think this is—I I wouldn't want to take any 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 view or position. It's important that we have these types of of conversations and to be not fearful. I, I think that the last thing that we want to have is uninformed uh, conversations where we are banning things just because they sound scary. So I, I think we, we have to have informed decision and training lawyers in both data science and law can actually help with making these informed decisions. But what they what the end result is, I think is something that has to come through either the political process or in case of law societies, the, the sort of self-regulatory process. I guess we'll 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 see what happens. It definitely sounds like um, there is stuff to think about there. 
So we talked about uh, the bilingualism of Canada, but uh, Mina from the audience also points out and um, Canada is bi-juridical. So um, she, she asked, for example, um, if there are such contracts that fall under the civil code, but a lot of the concepts regarding insurance are based on common concepts. So um, how would NEI navigate that kind of uh, both legal systems being involved there? Yeah, that's, that's actually one of the uh, first questions that I had asked myself when I came here, how in, in, in systems like the, uh, the EU, for instance, you uh, part of making the legal system work requires a lot of equivalence um, architecture. So you, you have to be sure that one term in French means a certain term in English in order to make European law uniform. And that actually, in my view, fueled a lot of legal informatics infrastructure in the, in the European Union, because lots of people that had to think about, okay, well, we really have to standardize this. We have to, we have to make sure that uh, it is consistent. And when I came to Canada, I was a little bit surprised how, uh, how ad hoc this, yeah, the duality is sometimes treated. And uh, if I remember correctly, even the Department of Justice started projects in order to uh, have something like a glossary in order to, to standardize terms a little bit. But as far as I know, it, it didn't really, it didn't lead to any, any uh, uh, official adoptions, or at least not that I'm aware of. I mean, I, I'm not a subject matter expert, but I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done similar to what has been done in the European Union to think about standardization and equivalency. And that in turn might then be fueled by this idea of law as code, because if we are trying to automate more, then standardization becomes more important. And that then has implications for how we treat differences, both bilingual differences and uh, by juridical differences. And then, and we don't need to get into this, but of course there's also the indigenous legal uh, tradition, which is even harder than to bring into this picture because it's mostly based on oral, uh, uh, yeah, yeah uh, it's preserved in oral form and not so much in written form. So I think, uh, yeah, these are challenges for, for the future. And I don't, I don't have an answer to, to that. That's a great answer. It also brings up a, a point that's really interesting to me, which is kind of the, the flexibility of the law and the, the nuance, how things you, you think are a certain way might actually be slightly different, which, which has a big effect in the analysis. And I was thinking about this before when you spoke about similarity. Um, it seems uh, to me like similarity can be very applied in very different ways and case can be considered very uh, similar in, in very different manners. Um, there's a huge difference, for example, between the common law and the, the civil law. So I want to ask you here, how does this work with AI? Can AI do this kind of nuanced similarity analysis or how does this work? Well, I think you, you raise a very good point that really is more of a sort of technical one. It's, it's really more of a of a reasoning by analogy point, a philosophical one even, how, how do you know whether two things are similar? Uh, a cat and a dog might be very dissimilar, but both of them are pets, so they are perhaps more similar to each other than uh, perhaps a dog is to, to a tree, right? So similarity is always a matter of, of degrees. It's a matter of, um, it's a matter of assessment. What, what, what are you comparing? And I think depending on, or as long as you are, conscious of what you are trying to compare and, and what the uh, what the benchmark is, AI can help, but it cannot do everything. So, so for instance, when we when we compared the, the treaties, one thing we, we knew was we were comparing tax token. So how do we how do states write their their agreements? Two countries might actually try to say the very same thing using different words, and our similarity algorithm would have pointed out that they are actually dissimilar, even if they mean the same thing to, to a lawyer. And that is, of course, then because we are comparing text tokens and not, not meaning. So if we were interested in meaning, we would perhaps then not an an um, analyze text tokens, but we would try to represent the legal meaning by perhaps coding things either by hand or uh, if it's standardized enough, perhaps with, with semi-automated procedure, and then compare this, this type of similarity using an ontology. So 
you, you, I think what's true in, in any of these applications is that you have to have a good understanding of what you're doing, what the tools are doing, so that you, you know that you're on the right track and that you're actually getting at what you're trying to get at. And uh, like with any type of technology, it's, it's, this is no magic way to get at something that humans couldn't, could, couldn't get at. It's really about scaling things that we could do, but that we really don't want to do or would, would take a long time. But it doesn't, it doesn't uh, replace our critical thinking, our analytical thinking. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Really interesting. And I really like that you touched on international law here, which um, I'd also like to ask a bit more specifically about. It seems like there would be many, many different agreements, but that could have potentially different sources and, and that could be interesting but challenging. So I wanted to ask you, um, what is uh, the goal um, you pursued in analyzing these documents? And uh, did you find any challenges that were, were specific to this domain? Well. I think there are many challenges specific to, to international law. One of them is that uh, because, at least until recently, because there's not so much commercial interest, uh, there are very few tools available that actually help uh, lawyers or, or even states to apply data science to international law. And so you suddenly have things like the World Court, which at least if you call the ICJ by that name, uh, it sounds really important, right? But the tools that we have in order to analyze the, the decisions that that court makes are actually much less sophisticated than uh, uh, the tools that we use in order to uh, investigate a state's court in, in Arkansas or Kentucky, right? So, so there's a bit of a disconnect between the ostensible importance of this field, field of law and the types of tools that we, we apply to it. The other thing, of course, is that international law there are lots of power asymmetries in international law and uh, what is written in the agreements doesn't always reflect the underlying reality uh, on the ground and that was one of the ambitions also when we tackled this project is to then bring about some of these hidden power asymmetries so going back to these bilateral investment treaties that i was talking about earlier not only do countries have very specific templates? But one of the things that became clear is that there are also clear rule taker and rule maker dynamics. So developing countries are often the rule takers. So they basically sign at the dotted line based on the model agreements that developed states propose to them, while developed states are the rule makers that set the terms of the agreement. So on its face, if you were to read that treaty, it would say, look, this is totally reciprocal. Both countries agree to the same terms. But once you have this data analysis and you, you see who actually set the terms, you realize, well, it's a little bit more asymmetric than the text of the treaty would, would reveal. And so I think it's, it's above all the, the importance of international law that should incentivize us to do more work on it. At the same time, there are also lots of challenges, accessibility of data. A lot of international law is actually hidden in archives and, and uh, state positions that are not accessible. So like with, with domestic law, the data architecture is, is really, really important. So there are lots of challenges there, but I think it's worthwhile to, to pursue it. That does sound like a really, really interesting research, but one that's not perhaps um, super obvious that you would apply this kind of analysis in that area. And I know you've been in this field for a while, so, so I want to ask you, is there any kind of area that you feel deserves more of this analysis, but where it's not really happening at the moment? Well, I don't think that there is really any area that's specifically sort of that stands out. I, I think what I would encourage everybody is to just take the baggage that they have, the skills that they have, the expertise that they have, and to think about what data science can do in their domain. I think that's much more useful than to, to push people in a, into a certain direction because there are just so many low hanging fruit. There are so many things that we can do, so many questions we can ask that, yeah, I think every domain offers, offers really interesting insights. So, uh, I mean, I, to be honest, one of the reasons why I got into international law was because I was just interested in international law. If, if I had grown up elsewhere or studied something else, I might have applied these, these tools to something completely different. So it, it really is for everyone to discover the, uh, the beauty of this in their own field. 
That sounds super exciting, I think. And um, it also really neatly brings us, I think, to, to our concluding question, which is, um, what advice would you give to legal students who want to enter this area of legal research? Well, take my course uh, to, to, be, uh, to become familiar with these types of legal data science tools. I, I think, especially for young lawyers, but also young researchers who are worried about their place either in the legal field or in, in, in legal scholarship, this is an area where so many opportunities lie. And that is especially so because the older generation might have problems either catching up or even you know, seeing the value in these types of tools. So I think there's actually an, an age advantage. We often talk about an age disadvantage where young people struggle to, to enter the field. I think in this case, it's actually the other way around where older generations might struggle to, to re really get into this space while younger people can bring this insight uh, to bear and have the time to acquire these types of skill sets. So I would just encourage everyone to, to make use of these resources to contribute to the creation of resources. We've talked a little bit about this already, but it, I think it, it, it's worth mentioning a lot of this boils down to crowdsourcing, to creating an infrastructure that allows everybody to partake and to contribute. So I think there's lots that can be done, many, many low hanging fruit. It's really about seizing the opportunity and then to yeah, to make a mark in this emerging field because it's it's a young field and lots remains to be done. A great answer. It makes me really excited to be part of this field as well. So, so thank you. So including, um, I would really like to thank you, Wolfgang. Uh, that was a very interesting and a very thought-provoking discussion. So thank you so much for these great answers. Thank you.